Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies, on this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing fellow naturopathic doctor, author, educator, and entrepreneur, Dr. Jay Tita. He combines over 30 years of experience in personal training with 20 years in functional medicine in his next level human program. Now in this episode, we'll be diving into how we both have come to realize a couple things when it comes to getting results with clients. And we've realized that you got to address the nervous system and the subconscious mind before you can see lasting results with muscle, metabolism, weight loss, you name it, chron- any kind of chronic illness. So Jade and I dive into how emotions can block healing. We talk about quantum medicine. We talk about biofields. We talk about Jake's take on structured water, longevity, and more. So if you're stuck in your health journey or you're wondering like if there's just something holding you back from achieving optimal health when it seems like people around you are, are getting quick fixes and, and you're just stuck, this podcast will definitely enlighten you because Jade and I are going to talk about what's out there in the research and what two docs he and I actually see in real life as we see clients. And we talk about patterns we're seeing. We talk about how things are developing, the connections between emotions and illness. And we talk about what it really takes to get true, lasting, optimal health. This one's a great podcast. We have a great conversation and it's it's two naturopaths getting real. So let's jump into the podcast and introduce you to Dr. Jade Tita. Dr. Jade Tita, welcome to the Health Fix podcast. Hey, Janine, how are you? So excited to be here. Uh, happy to have this conversation. Looking forward to it. Oh, man, it's always good when I get to talk with a naturopath, especially one that was in the same realm as me at Mm -hmm. Bastyr in the same years, even though we didn't we we didn't we maybe talked. Who knows? Like it was so long ago. Like who who the heck knows? Right. So nevertheless, today I want to just bring in the conversation of how you and I have both kind of evolved in our practices, you know, we we got why we got into naturopathic medicine in the first place and then how it's come to be like, okay, we need something more. We got to up level. And of course, next level human, what you got going on there is is the, let's say, the peak of what I would love mm. to be helping folks with. So yeah. let's give folks a little background. Like you jumped into naturopathic medicine. What drew you to it? What drew your brother to it? Both of you guys? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, well, first of all, my mom is, uh, I would call her one of the original new age hippies kind of thing. So I grew up in a household with a mother who was very much into natural living. And uh, believe it or not, I actually started personal training at 15 years old. So uh, I say that because that's the first time I ever got paid to write a program for somebody, right? You know, to actually, I was writing programs and workout programs for my football teammates. And then I started doing programs for their mothers and family members and things like that. And so my mom was very much into health food and that kind of stuff. I got into fitness sort of very early, started personal training very early, uh, worked through high school, through undergrad doing that, worked through Bastyr University Medical (laughs) School, uh, basically paid my way through uh, Bastyr by personal training and bartending, which is interesting, which uh, we'll get into in just a minute because it does dovetail into my interest in psychology. And so my interest has always been lifestyle, you know, sort of health, fitness, nutrition, and psychology stuff. And probably like a lot of people to get into this work, I actually did not think actually much about it, Janine. I was on my way to traditional medical school, uh, and it was basically all set to go. I had a mentor there at East Carolina University who uh, was grooming me to kind of come into that uh, program. And then I happened to look at the curriculum. (laughs) for traditional medicine. And I don't know why I had never looked at it before, but uh, it was, you know, to that point, it's like, okay, what am I going to be studying? And what I found was uh, no surprise, probably to a lot of people listening to this and certainly no surprise to you, no nutrition, no psychology, no fitness. And so all of a sudden here I am thinking that's what I'm already doing. This is what I want to make my life's work. And I'm like, you mean to tell me I'm not getting any training in psychology, no training in in nutrition and no training in exercise. 
And that kind of put me into uh, a little bit of a tailspin, actually, a little bit of a early midlife crisis, I guess, <laughs> in my early 20s. And I was like, what am I going to do now? And at the time, now for you and I, it's been a while, right? So at the time, if someone had mentioned naturopathic medicine or functional medicine really wasn't a thing, that was considered like witchcraft, new age, woo-woo medicine. No one had any idea it was going to go mainstream. At that point in time, I was like, you know what? I'm doing this. And I know that everyone, all, my mentor told me don't do it. My my dad told me don't do it. My brother Keone was finishing up his master's degree and he decided, hey, I'm going to do that too. And so that was sort of the evolution into uh, naturopathic medicine, which I think we might call functional medicine now. We were the original functional medicine practitioners and are the original functional medicine practitioners. And then I spent most of my time in clinic when I came out of Bastyr, basically working side by side in the clinic and building a health and fitness business. So anyone who uh, knows some of my past work knows that, you know, I started a company called Metabolic Effect, metabolic.com, basically made a lot of my inroads with workouts. And this will bring us up to uh, present day and what you and I were talking about just before we got online. One of the things about me is for better or for worse, Janine, I am one of these people who uh, is a little bit of a renegade uh, and a little bit can go a little bit rogue at times, but I am someone who just wants to do what works. So I, so I don't really care where it comes from, whether it's traditional medicine, natural medicine, ancient practices, uh, I don't care. I just want to do things that work for my clients. And that's one of the reasons I went into naturopathic medicine first, because I was like, well, traditional medicine is great at emergency care. They absolutely suck at chronic disease. I want to do lifestyle medicine. So I moved into naturopathic medicine. But I will tell you and admitted this to you right before we came online, that I also, after 20 years in the functional medicine space, have also become disillusioned with the ability to get real results for people. Now, make no mistake, it is light years better in my mind, this medicine for chronic disease issues than traditional medicine uh, could ever be. That being said, though, I still bumped into this arena where I'm like, I am not serving most of the people that I see. They're either not able to make the change or when they are making the change, these things are not necessarily doing the trick. And so this is what has got me into the work I've been doing for probably the last 10 years or so, maybe perhaps a little bit longer than that. And that is in the psychology realm and in the realm of what I might call uh, quantum metabolism or uh, transpersonal psychology, basically looking at what goes on in the subconscious psychology. So if we take the idea of neuroendocrine immune system, uh, put psycho neuroendocrine immune on that, and then put on that biofield and the quantum field into the psycho neuroendocrine immune system. And so what I've gone is sort of deeper into what is actually driving our psychology, our neurology, our endocrinology, our Im immunology. And what I have found is that a lot of that is stuff that you and I never really learned in that. You may have. I never did. You were a little bit more broad in your education, right? You know, you did a dual track into uh, acupuncture and oriental medicine and that kind of thing. I never did that. Uh, my brother did. But now I find myself squarely studying and paying attention to some of the things, frankly, Janine, that I uh, ignored and or avoided because of my evidence-based mindset when we were in school. Like, for example, we studied chakras and we studied energy medicine and we studied some of this stuff. And I, I kind of saw that as fringe and didn't pay much attention to it. So it is surprising now that I am in squarely in that space and delving into that space and finding that I'm able to achieve outcomes that I am not able to achieve with the supplements and the diet and the exercise and very excited about that. So that's my long winded sort of way of bringing you on the journey of where I am today. And I know you and I, uh, you know, you, we overlap a little bit on this journey. So, yeah, so that's my story in a nutshell. It's, you know, I think it's not, it's, it's a beginning to be more of a common one mm -hmm. as a lot of us naturopaths are getting in the game longer and being like, mm -hmm. There's something, there's something else. There's got to be something else. Or if we're folks that like, like, I'm much like you, if I'm not getting results, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. 
you know, and I'm like, I need something else, not something else, something else. Yeah. And, and the quantum and in this realm is definitely where I'm feeling like, okay, mm. I have found the holistic, mm. I have found the whole thing. But like, like you, I totally was like, when we talk about chakras, I'm like, oh God, like mm. even in acupuncture, like I, I, my brain was, I put the needles, I get rid of the pain. I don't think about the energy. Mm. Like what the heck? I'm like, isn't oh. that interesting? Yeah. How much, how much should we miss out on? I don't know. Mm. But. Yeah, well, you know, he, so here's the thing. I'd be curious where you are with this, right? So one of the things about this was first just sort of going in, when you're in clinic, what you see is you see there's art and science to everything we do, right? So one of the things I began to see is particular patterns that I uh, ignored and avoided for a long time. And these patterns were essentially what I might call emotional patterns, Uh we could even call it traumatic trauma type stuff. I just don't love the word trauma because a lot of people don't relate to it. It's very overused and not everyone has big capital T traumas in their lives. However, we all go through childhood development, adolescent development, young adult development. And of course, even in adulthood, we all deal with difficulties. We all deal with trials and tribulations. I mean, one of the one of the things we could say about being human is that we all suffer. Like, you know, you and I have just met Janine, you know, we know that we each suffer. We know all the listeners suffer. They know that about us. It's what is the commonality between us humans. And when I say, say suffering, I mean, uh, mental emotional suffering. So to me, suffering is the mental emotional equivalent of physical pain. And what I feel is that medicine has completely avoided and or had nothing to say in this realm. And what I began to see is that people's mental emotional suffering seemed to coincide with certain conditions. And certainly I couldn't make much sense of that and still honestly can't in terms of being able to be like, oh, someone has grief or someone has betrayal or someone has this and it correlates with a specific disease. I don't know anything about that yet. But what I did see is that there was always this mental emotional suffering component that seemed to precede and or come along with uh, certain conditions. And that made that's the thing that made me start paying attention. And then when I started getting into things like uh, meditation, uh, certainly breath work, uh, these kinds of things, seeing some of the emotional releases that would occur in, in uh, for example, some of the psychedelic therapies that I started to delve into, and then seeing some of these physical complaints also clearing up. This is the thing that started to make me play, uh, pay sort of close attention. And maybe we could start this discussion and I'll get your sort of take on this and see what you think about this. But one of the things I started to see is that emotions, something that I have largely not been you know, trained in and paid much attention to, even in naturopathic school, seem to be to me to be something that was important, almost like maybe a spiritual mental, emotional, inflammatory marker, let's say, certain emotions, like emotions like anger and frustration and resistance and anxiety and insecurity and depression seem to be preceding oftentimes uh, some of the physical complaints that I was dealing with. So I started looking very closely at emotions. And funnily enough, there's not much there and there still is not much there. But now that I began to see emotions much like, let's say, a, a twisted ankle, that gets hot, red, and swollen to make you pay attention to that ankle so that you don't damage it further, I started to see these emotions as uh, sort of like the twisted ankle of the psyche, making you pay close attention. Almost like saying, hey, Jade, hey, Janine, hey, listener, this is where you need to look. There's a pattern here. There's an obstacle here. A stuck emotion pointing us to something that is holding us back in our lives. And that's what then got me back looking at chakras, actually, because then I was like, OK, well, if these emotions are associated with, uh, you know, sort of physical, sort of physical things, how can I tie this back in? And then I remembered, oh, we studied this at one point. We looked at these energy centers that Ayurvedic medicine talked about. And I went back and started looking at that. And lo and behold, actually, a couple of years ago, now we know the chakras have actually been proven to exist via, uh, you know, science. Uh, they have actually measured these electromagnetic fields in specific areas that correlate to these old chakra centers. And that's what got me to start 
paying close attention. So now I am dealing very much with emotional states and processing the stories that come around with those emotional states. And many of those stories harken back to childhood development, adolescent development, young adult development, and even adult betrayals and difficulties and trials and tribulations. And this seems to be uh, where I am beginning to make inroads again. You can only get so far with diet and exercise, and this is adding another layer. I'm not going to say that it's the the holy grail, perhaps. I think we still have a long way to go to understand exactly all the components. But to your point and what you mentioned, it seems to be another important holistic component that we've been ignoring, certainly I have, that now that I'm beginning to address this seems to be making bigger differences. Hey, Hell Junkies, wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas too. This day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happywholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not gonna remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. And so I'd be curious your thoughts, your experience in this realm and and any any of things that uh, you've also noticed in this regard. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I I too was kind of like ignoring it, you know, oh, that's woo woo. Even though like Chinese medicine also kind of like the chakras, you can line up the emotions with the different locations in the body, the different channels. And after a certain point in time, I couldn't ignore it anymore because the same patterns kept showing up. And now that I've reached the point where I've seen the same people in the Tacoma, Washington area for over a decade, I started to see the evolution of their health. And I'm sure you've probably seen that too with evolution, people you've seen for a long time. You're like, oh my gosh. And because I focus mostly with with women and like now we're, we're going into the perimenopause and menopause thing. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, the emotions are everywhere and I'm seeing signs. They're all connecting. Mm-hmm. Crap, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't pay attention. But, but yes, I 100% have been able to kind of start connecting the dots with chakra or even like the Chinese medicine emotion and organ connections. It's disturbing sometimes how accurate Mm. yeah i'm curious can you educate me on where these some of these emotions are i know like some of them i think i know like what anger is associated with the liver uh Mm -hmm. certain things like that but is that what you're you're kind of lining up and these chakras and the traditional chinese medicine overlap a little bit i that's an area that i'm not well versed in but i'm curious about yeah. So the way I'm kind of overlapping in by, by all means, it like it's it's not 100 percent perfect. Mm. But if someone's got anger, right, yes, totally mm. goes with the liver. Then I'm going to look at what's going on with the the sternal chakra there mm. and I'm going to see, OK, what's going on in that department doesn't link. Or are we pushing stuff up to the throat chakra? Mm. Because we'll see in Chinese medicine, the liver gets stuck and it pushes stuff up to mm. the heart, which chakra wise it's also pushing stuff heart and it can go all the way up to the throat because there's the Mm. heart chakra there's the throat chakra Mm. so i'm seeing that now heart that emotion is anxiety it's Mm. also overjoy but i have i have yet to see someone that i really would be like oh they are too overjoy i want that i want (laughs) that i want that someday um but the anxiety yes you know the the spleen the digestive system this is worry kidneys Mm. fear and, and lungs are all about grief. And mm. so we have those main ones. And then there's the paired organs, of course, that go with them. So like grief, large intestine and lung mm. and liver, gallbladder go with anger and heart and small intestine go along with the anxiety. And so now you can see why we have IBS, right? Mm, and all the yeah. gut stuff. And so it's just like, oh my gosh, why? Mm. Why did I ignore this? I'm not sure. And like kidneys, kidneys goes with urinary bladder just um, to complete out and spleen stomach for the digestive there mm. for worry. So it's like, gosh, how did I miss this? Mm. But they do, they do correlate 
if you look um, across the, the the pattern for chakra to Chinese organs, like kidneys are right in the area starting to go down low towards sacral chakra and pelvic floor stuff. It's crazy. Oh, I love that. I love, I love it so much. Right. And I do think that one of the things that after being in this space for a while and being a, a pretty evidence-based guy for a very long time, I do think that, uh, you know, avoiding the art of this has not served me, uh, you know, so now I'm squarely back in this area. And I also, uh, began to look at this in, in kind of a three-part process, really, like from my perspective, we have a lot, like, there is some really cool stuff going on right now in our field, right? There are some people using breath works and meditation, you know, someone that uh, comes to mind is someone like a Joe Dispenza doing a lot of work in that area. And one of the things that I have seen is that, and this is the way my brain works. And this is just for the listener and me and you, because you know, I'm curious to learn from you about this. But one of the things I saw is that some of these people, a very small minority from what I can see, are having some pretty amazing healing stories. And I've seen this with psychedelics. And I've kind of spent the last year doing every psychedelic on the planet. You know, um, I'm not, I've never been, quote, a drug user when I was young, but now I'm doing all these ceremonial things, probing this area, and also lots of different. Uh, meditation techniques. And what I've seen is some pretty amazing stuff, but also that it was largely uh, in the minority of these people. So a lot of these people were just coming back to psychedelics again and again and again. It was like a pattern, very much like people trying diet after diet after diet and not getting the results or coming back to med these meditation techniques. And so one of the things that I began to look at is I was like, well, as a naturopathic principle, right? Like one of our major principles is to first and always remove blocks. And so one of the things that I was just kind of like, all right, well, maybe there's a block. What is the block? So, you know, it's like you got the, the psychedelics, they're trying to move things. You got the meditation, the breath work, they're trying to move things. But it's, it's kind of like in the naturopathic world, we have this thing where if you're in a toxic environment and you add in supplements and all that kind of stuff, one of the first things we've learned is get the person out of the toxic environment first then you can begin to make headway in some of our treatments. And so one of the things I started doing is going, well, what's the toxic environment perhaps that is still blocking them from getting movement? And one of the things that that then forced me to look at is development, child development, adolescent development, young adult development. When we're forming our first beliefs and definitions and stories about the world. And so one of the things that I came to a hypothesis is I was like, well, we need to clear that first. If someone's got a deep seated story, and I call these mud, by the way, misguided unconscious decisions, they're misguided because we form them at times during development where we didn't have the wisdom, the know-how, the maturity to make sense of them. They're unconscious because they are there and we're not aware that they're controlling us to a large degree. And their decisions, because whether we were aware of them or not, we did choose to see ourselves or the world in a particular way. And so one of the things that I began to do is look at this psychological mud and began to want to clear it and or to see if I could begin to clear it. And we do know through evidence-based research that a lot of what happens in the early psychology around, of course, trauma and difficulty is that the nervous system... Uh, here we go, psycho neuro. <laughs> so the nervous system can get stuck in hyperfunction or hypofunction. So this isn't just esoteric woo. It is certainly where the psychology is beginning to impact the, the nervous system. And so that became my first sort of uh, place that I wanted to spend time. And I started to look into all of the tools, technologies, research that we have to unwind our initial misguided unconscious decisions or stories. So this really fell, Janine, right into the area of uh, identity and beliefs, not habits and behaviors. So one of the first thing I was like, I was like, it's not habits and behaviors because habits and behaviors flow out of identity and beliefs. And where do these beliefs and stories come from? Well, they come from these misguided unconscious decisions. And so I started to use uh, very powerful journaling techniques, meditation techniques, and breath work for that initial clearing so that I could get them out of the toxic environment of their habitual thoughts and feelings. Then adding in some of these feeling-based psychedelics and or uh, Joe Dispenza type of meditations. And then, of course, we do live in a 3D world and a physical reality. And so you have to take 
action. And so this was the the process that I began to explore. And this is the process that I believe has begun to unlock for a very large percent of the people I work with who weren't getting results with all the other stuff, they're starting to see results now. And so just to repeat that, it's one, a clearing or a rewriting of the uh, narratives, beliefs, and definitions that we hold. And that means going backwards in time and looking at where those came from. That's part one. Part two is sort of a rewiring of the feeling state, the emotions, and getting us into these states of gratitude and joy and acceptance. And this is where some of the Dispenza-esque type of you know meditation comes in. And then there's sort of this be it till you see it or as if principle type of action, which we have a lot of research in this area in terms of exposure therapy. And this is sort of the way that I've been unwinding this, starting with the emotions and having them guide us. So if there's a stuck emotion, one of the things that, that, that I tend to teach my patients and clients is that emotions are meant to be felt, not lived. They're not meant to be stuck. And so when they're stuck, that does point us to potential issues with these misguided unconscious decisions that we, we need to unlock. So if you're a listener listening to this conversation with me and Janine, and you're wondering if this is you, all you have to do is look at your life and go, am I constantly having repeated patterns in finance, in health and fitness, in personal relationships? Am I constantly running into the same recurrent obstacles? Am I feeling a stuck emotion that's been in my life for a very long time, recurrent anger, recurrent anxiety, recurrent depression, these kinds of things? If so, it's a good indication that you're dealing with this misguided unconscious decision in your spiritual matrix that is causing you to uh, not be able to get well or to live the life uh, that you're meant to live. And so this is uh, sort of the formula that I've been using. So I'm wondering, you know, always when I talk to another practitioner, I'm always wanting to learn how they see this and how they themselves are unwinding this process. Oh my gosh. I I see it very similar to you. I base a lot on, on my principles with Chinese medicine because that's what I'm closest to, right? Because it's mm -hmm. what I've used for years. So I often will look at when someone's telling me something, you know, all the emotions and even in myself. And I'm probably a really good example because not too long ago, kind of right around when COVID hit, I was done. I was like, I'm sick of this medicine. I'm not mm -hmm. getting results. I don't want to do this anymore. And so I had to take a look and go like, all right, what is this little tantrum coming from? Right? Like mm -hmm. What in my what in my past? And I wouldn't have thought about it before that because the prior to that, I didn't realize that my thoughts create my reality. I had no idea. You know, I just thought I think things and that's what happens, right? And so in terms of having to unwire, like undo it for myself and rewire myself, I kind of take my patients through a very similar process as you. I, I tend to kind of go off of what what I did and literally look back and go, all right, when did you first start feeling this the symptom that's really overwhelming or when did you first start experiencing like you said those patterns mm. those repeat patterns and it's fascinating to put the dots together with someone and then kind of go back through and see if like what little symptoms kind of started then and what might have evolved till now and because i do a lot of hormone replacement therapy and do work with hormones i tend to also look at like our period cycles and what was going on in that time frame too which is fascinating for, mm. for me to kind of look through and go like Oh, so your period then was really heavy and crazy with lots of clots and you were angry, <laughs> you know, That's just fun, so fascinating. Fun yeah, so, yeah. I could geek out for hours on mm. it, but ultimately, yeah, my, my process is very similar to you looking at like the emotion, looking at the patterns. I'd love to find patterns. I love to help people find patterns. So yeah, it's, it's pattern identification and really guiding someone through versus like, you know, a lot of people think, and, and I don't know if you get this, like, okay, I'm going to work with you. And it's going to be like a cognitive based therapist. Like we're going to talk. I'm like, no, nah, we're going to do a lot more than just talk. Mm -hmm. I just want to yeah. know some details and I'm going to help you find a pattern and identify a pattern with yeah. me. But yeah, that's kind of how I, I work very similarly. It's, it's fascinating to hear your, like what you're up to. I'm sure we have lots of intricate. like Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like we have a lot of overlap and, and I'm also with you in terms of this work. It's not it's very different than thought talk therapy, right? It's like, you know, one of the things I, I tell my clients and patients, I'm like, look, if you if you cut your finger when you're, you know, cutting vegetables or something like that, there's not much you need to do other than, you know, make sure it's clean and and, and it will, it's going to heal itself. You know, it's an, and and even if you didn't, like chances are it's going to heal itself. It has this self healing, uh, you know, sort of potential. And for me, I look at the, the emotions and that kind of stuff. If you make space 
right? It's kind of like if you cut your finger and you just go about your business, you, you have a bad cut on your finger and you just go about your business, you don't make any space to take care of it, you're going to bleed out all over the place and it's going to take forever for that wound to heal. And perhaps it won't. Perhaps it's going to get infected. The whole point of a physical wound and the pain that comes along with it and all that is to make you pay attention so you do something about it. And so when I look at this work, it's not necessarily talk therapy because that's too logical. That's conscious brain stuff. Remember, these are misguided, unconscious decisions. And so we logic, this is where I think talk therapy goes wrong a little bit, right? You can't logic your way out of something that is stuck in your nervous system or stuck in your biofield if we're going to get a little bit even more woo-woo, right? You can't, so you have to go into the realm of the unconscious, which doesn't speak in logic and linear rationality. It speaks in symbol, it speaks in metaphor, and it speaks in feeling. And so a lot of what I'm doing, again, back to naturopathic principles, which I'm very grateful for our training, because for me, it's putting them in nervous system states that can, or brain states, uh, altered conscious states that allow their body to actually begin to pay attention to the wound, the mental, emotional suffering, so that it can begin to heal. And lo and behold, what you will find is people will spontaneously go through these emotional states. They'll all of a sudden feel this tightness in their chest, start feeling anger beginning to come up, feel that move into sadness, start to begin to cry and shed. And if they don't have an emotional feeling, they might shake or they might twitch, or they might go through a, a, a incessant yawning or start coughing. Sometimes they'll even have a bowel movement or vomit. Or And this is this, I used to just see all this as just physical. And now I see it as this is the body moving. And by the way, I don't really need to say much to you other than to get you in this altered consciousness mainly in my work through certain types of breath work. I use a breath work that I developed called breath enhanced emotional processing. So all it really is, is holotropic breathing. If you know what that is, uh, those of you listening, but it's a type of breath work that then guides you into look at the emotional processes in your body and then give you space to sort of shed that emotional energy. And what's really interesting about that is most of this work you're actually doing yourself or just letting your body do, and you get to just sit back and observe what it's doing. And then when you come out of that, I use uh, uh, written exposure therapies and certain types of journaling techniques that help you also process a little bit more logically and, and consciously. And this to me, it's I really love that you said that because it really speaks to for a long time, I was like, what am I doing here? I'm not really doing much other than putting them in this, in this state and their bodies doing it themselves. And for a while there, I was like, Jade, like you're not doing anything, right? And, th and I, then I remembered, you know, sort of our medicine and I go, oh, this is very much like just, you know, getting them to not keep running through a, a field of potholes so they don't retwist their ankle. It's like giving them the space to self-heal. One of the things that we know, all we have all the evidence in the world, no one needs a study to tell us this. If you injure yourself and cut yourself, your body will heal itself. It has the potential to do that. Well, it has the potential to do it in this work as well. It's just that none of us are giving ourselves the space to do it. You know, in, in times past, we used to be able to sit in silence. We had, uh, you know, much more, um, much more reverence for the emotional processes in our body and not a whole lot of cultural blocks telling us that if we're a woman, we can't feel anger or if we're a man, we can't feel sadness or these kinds of things. And so this is where I think it begins. And then, of course, uh, it, it starts to dovetail into a little bit of self-guided what I'm trying to create. That's the next part. But I'm really excited to hear you say that and wondering if especially, you know, I'm wondering because I don't Keone does my brother who, you know, does acupuncture. I've never been much into it. I think he's given me two acupuncture treatments <laughs> in, the, in the in the last 20 years, right, since we got trained. But I'm wondering if, you know, uh, you know, now I'm like, you know, moving and supporting people with the energetics that you use through acupuncture and other things, if you're seeing that to be helpful in this realm. You know, it's like, it's almost like a gateway. It's almost like we use it to open the doors and then they don't need it anymore. And because I'm not in the office all the time now, because I'm I'm traveling a lot, I've dropped down my amount of acupuncture. So what's happened is when I see them, 
like once every few months when I'm in town, that's when we're like, okay, let's work on what's what's going on here, get the things flowing. And then they're back into working on on their their programs again. And so it's like, it's almost like it opens the door mm. for them again, or clears anything that may be like a little gunk or a little mm. litter along the way. Yeah. But truthfully, I do, I, I believe in acupuncture for helping in certain situations and acute situations um, for, for pain. But when we're looking at the emotional, I feel like we don't need it as much as we've been taught mm. to think we need it you know, we can do a lot of it on our own. So essentially I'm replacing myself as an acupuncturist by teaching people to, to take care of themselves and their emotions themselves and clear things themselves. Yeah. So. I love that. And what tools are you using primarily then are, you know, is it similar breath work, meditation type stuff, or, you know, other energetic things like that? Breath work mainly. Um, some of the other stuff would be, well, acupressure, tapping so mm -hmm. eft tapping is a lot of tapping yeah. um in the practice too and then a lot of times it's visualization yeah and and thinking through things too yeah. so that's kind of like my my main ones yeah yeah and one of the things i here's one thing i'd love to get your take on too i use a lot of what i might call a dimensional consciousness for those of you who are familiar with maybe internal family systems it's very similar internal family systems for those of you listening who don't know what that is it's basically a a, a technique a therapeutic technique that essentially treats your emotions as sort of like separate psychic entities that you can dialogue with, right? So it's giving room for anger to express itself and quote, coming to the living room of your conscious mind and be able to express itself and give sadness room to express itself. So one of the things I do is I refer to this as sort of this dimensional consciousness that we can sort of objectify different aspects of ourselves. So we certainly can do that with our child self. So there's a little JD that I can dialogue with, right? And he has his histories and his ways and his personality. And some of those personalities are dysfunctional and some of those personalities are really useful. Like he can be really fun for me and I can tap into him when I want to have some joy and some laughter in my life. But he also can be, you know, throw some temper tantrums and have a little bit of anger and have some of these stuck fear-based responses. And dialoguing with him allows me to see this sort of psychic personality of mine that it, that is alive within my greater sort of consciousness. And I do the same thing with emotions and same thing even with body parts. Actually, when my mom was diagnosed with kidney cancer, one of the things that we did is we had her sort of objectify her kidneys and begin to see them as a benevolent uh, friend that is functioning with her, that needs her attention and her love and that she could dialogue with. And so this dimensional consciousness work is really interesting, especially when you're dealing with your emotions, because I do think because emotions are so unconscious, uh, you know, and they're in kind of unconscious processes, we need ways to dialogue with them. And so there's a socialization that you can have around your emotional states and also certain psychic entities in your past you could even do this in your uh, in your future. And by the way, in case you all are wondering, there's actually a lot of good research in this particular area in terms of uh, being able to dialogue with your future self through future authoring, writing, and things like that. These things have been documented, but this is another technique, you know, as the listeners trying to understand what we're talking about here, it's another technique that can be really powerful in helping people work through uh, some of these, these processes. And so uh, that's another area that I'm interested in your take on and if there's anything there that you're using or familiar with. It's 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 been an interesting, you know, sort of piece of my work now. You know, I've I've dabbled. Let, mm. Let's be honest, I've dabbled in that area and haven't really dove into it as much as trying to work more on the level of talking with people where they're at mm. and 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 looking at that whereas trying to visualize their their other entities I, I i'll be honest i haven't really got there with that mm. with everybody i think there's been a few but mm. yeah i'm on the cusp of that one I'm yeah that yeah. yeah yeah and then another another area we could potentially go into and then you know wherever you want to go from that is that Part of the thing that I think would be interesting maybe for the listeners to sort of consider with this work, because it can se seem a little bit out there in many ways until you begin to look at uh, some of the things that, that uh, and some of this is controversial in the science, but in my, from my perspective, uh, well-proven. And this is 
the biofield, right? And so the biofield, I think, is sort of the go-between. Obviously, someone like you, Janine, has been working with this and energies for a long time because of your acupuncture. Uh, but I'm starting to understand, uh, you know, I think uh, how this translates and some of this new science around, um, you know, uh, structured water and exclusion zone water in the body and this idea of the quantum field. And I'll kind of go slow here because I think it'll be interesting for the listener and then see where you want to go with this. But one of the things we now know is that, uh, you know, physicists and, and most physicists who do quant quantum is becoming a buzzword that is always somewhat of a challenge and difficult. And, you know, even quantum physicists will tell you they don't quite understand uh, quantum physics. And certainly I am no physicist. And so this is an area that uh, I tread very lightly in. But one of the things that I think my perception around the quantum sort of field and you know, or what we might call the void is this idea of uh, potential and possibility. It is sort of the place where all potential and possibility resides. And if the, anyone who's confused about that, that we have study after study after study showing that essentially we humans are mostly empty space. If you go into an atom, it is mostly empty space. It is a world of frequencies and vibrations. It's not a world of matter. And so one of the things that's beginning to change is the idea of materialism, which has dominated science and still does, is that the brain and material matter creates consciousness and energetics. This new sort of uh, idea that I believe quantum phys physics is pointing us towards is that actually consciousness is everywhere and it is sort of, you know, permeates everything and it is what creates matter. So this idea of materialism and brain creating consciousness versus the idea that consciousness is actually coalescing into matter. And if we take that stand, now, of course, we don't know that that's right. So, But if we take this alternate hypothesis, it does open up an entirely new way to begin to dialogue with and work with the human body and the human condition. And so then we can essentially say, well, if that's the case as let's say the quantum field begins to coalesce and congeal into human form, then we have this go-between state that is the biofield, our energetic field that essentially informs our physical makeup. And what I believe we actually have or on the cusp of right now is that we even, I think, are beginning to understand how the biofield begins to translate into biochemistry and physiology. And this has to do with the new science of water and structured water in particular. And so just briefly for the listener, we think of water as three phases, right? We think of it as a gas, a solid, and a liquid. Well, when water is interacting with our biological systems, uh, hydrophilic systems or systems that like water, right? we have this uh, new form of water that's kind of like a viscous water. It, it, it forms almost like a crystalline pattern next to our biology. And what we see is that this water layer has energetics to it, almost like a battery, and may even have a form of uh, organization to it that organizes uh, our uh, physiology and our biochemistry. And by the way, our mitochondria which lots of people know how powerful mitochondria are, are partly involved with creating this water. But I do believe this is the only reason I bring this up is because it may be the first time that anyone's heard this sort of conversation. And one of the things I just wanted to make sure that we draw is like, okay, well, how does this energetic translate actually into physiology, perhaps, and, and coalesce into, let's say, these energetic centers of the biofield into physiology? It's probably coming from water and this this new understanding of water as an energy relay system and an, and an energy system uh, in general. So now we could say the quantum field coalesces into the biofield, which translates into biochemistry through the water layers uh, sort of in the body, which then begins to express itself in a physiological state. And so I do believe this is actually the science that explains how emotions and how this work that we are doing is translating into actual physiology. I agree. But what, what Jade's getting at is like thinking about how you're vibing 
like your good vibes affect the water you're going to drink, affect the water in your body, affect your cells in the body and affect the people around you, which yeah. is like, I don't know, I, I could go deep into that. But like also what's your take on even like the 5G and how that jacks with our mm. biofits? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting thing. These non-native EMFs, right? Because yeah. if we are if we are giving off an electromagnetic field, and we we certainly know that these different energy centers are giving off certain electromagnetic uh, frequencies that are unique to them. What are these non-native EMFs doing? Things like Wi-Fi and stuff like that. You know, what's interesting about that. I am one of these people that, to me, I don't see it as necessarily as scary as a lot of people uh, see it right now. Because I go. If it was that dangerous, it's certainly not, uh, you know, toxic to the point where we're all going to drop dead from it immediately. And also, I think that we have inherent ability, right? For example, let's say we know that if you come into the room and all of us who are listening to this, you know, let's say Janine comes into the room and she's angry or she's sad. We're all going to feel that, right? We're going to feel the energetics of her coming into the room. At the same time, we can set our energetics differently. So yes, we can be affected by that, but we also could be like, you know what? I'm not going to allow myself to be affected by that. We can change that, that frequency in a sense. We have the ability to do that. And so from my perspective, I feel like our electromagnetic field is can be uh, built up and be almost like a force field against that stuff. But I do think when we are weak, when we're not in the sun, when we're not eating well, when we're not doing these things, by the way, all this is, theoretical, perhaps these things are permeating our, our biofields and, and having destructive th capacities. But part of me goes, I don't know that that would be a smart way for the body to survive, right? You know, for, uh, you know, for us to have evolved. So I think we have the ability to, uh, to adapt uh, to these things in the same way that we might choose not to get caught up in an emotional turmoil of Janine when she walks into the room. I think there's something perhaps to be said for that, but like you, I'm paying very close attention to the idea. And, and I do believe we have some preliminary data showing that these things can be destructive to our energetics and perhaps our physiology. But I'm also one of these people that thinks that fear in particular, I'm one of these people that goes, toxi emotional toxicity might be one of the major things, if not the major thing that makes us susceptible to disease. And I'm using things like blue zones and things like that to, to correlate here, because obviously they all eat different things. Some of them drink alcohol and do all kinds of other stuff. Some of them have gone through incredibly traumatic events, like think about Okinawa and Japan and some of these blue zones there that they had to go through, you know, a mass traumas and yet they still have this so what's the difference it to me it is the way that they live in alignment and joy and gratitude and they have purpose and meaning inside their cultures and i believe these things are protective and so for me when i look at this kind of stuff i go well we have a lot of uh, areas in the world that are doing things that perhaps aren't the, the healthiest that don't seem to be affected why maybe this is is an answer yeah. It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's kind of like developing like your, your resilience to, mm -hmm. to outside vibration. Let's put it that way. I have a question about structured water mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people talking about drinking structured water. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? I'd love so my, my understanding is that that's not possible. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a way to uh, do things for water, to water, vortexing and things like that to, to, uh, but you can't create structured water, to my understanding, uh, in that way. It occurs when it when it is in interaction with biological substances, uh, substances that like water, substances like proteins and uh, nucleic acids and things like that. So structured water, if you're going to get it, it would come from you know eating fruit or something. Then maybe you're getting the structured water from that, but. Uh, and, and your mitochondria make this sort of water. So my understanding about exclusion zone water or structured water, and of course, the vocabulary is getting mixed here. Now, what I'm saying is exclusion zone water, as studied by Pollock and, and others, you know, there were people who were doing this research way before him, uh, that is all about when this water comes in contact with biological substances and forms these uh, exclusion zones, builds up these sort of layers of a uh, fourth phase of water. 
Uh, he does, by the way, in Pollock's work, if you read his work, he, he has shown uh, that very narrow ones can form next to metals uh, transiently. But, you know, I can't imagine that you're going to be able to put water into your glass beaker, uh, your, your water bottle or your stainless steel water bottle and drink it from that point of view. Now, whether or not uh, certain energized waters, vortexed waters, waters with particular minerals are, are easier to be made into structured water, uh, I don't know. But I, I think that that whole thing right now is marketing hype. It certainly could be that I am not well versed enough. And I would love if anyone's listening to this and, and has an answer to this that's better than mine, I would love to be corrected on this, but it doesn't make, actually, Janine, it doesn't make sense to me scientifically that that would be able to be created based on what I know about Pollock's work and, and the work that they were doing. I, I do think it's perhaps a mix up in uh, terminology, structured water is being used, that terminology is being used for a lot of different things. Um, and, and we also have a whole a new sort of vocabulary we're going to all have to learn on water in general because we're learning an awful lot about water and how mitochondria, the water that it creates, is creating deuterium-depleted water, is creating this ex uh, exclusion zone water. And these are all things that are very new areas. And with very new areas, they can be exciting. It's dangerous, though, because anything new is usually overemphasized and sometimes talked about in definitive terms prior to completely understanding that. And I see this, I think, happening. It's ripe for this, right? Because we now live in the world of social media where everyone just gets on and says things, whether they have an expertise or not. Now, I have been studying this pretty intensely for the last three years or so, uh, and I still don't understand it. So that tells you something that just reading a book on it and then getting on social media and talking about this, that's not what I think we need here. I think we need some caution uh, and uh, but I do think there's something perhaps here uh, that we need to pay attention to. But to answer your question, I don't think that you can drink a structured water out of your water bottle in that way. I wonder about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's in my mind, too. I was like, hmm. And I do get asked a lot about it, you know, when, when we start talking about energetic fields, you know, and, and structured water and and all kinds of different things. When we when we go off that conversation, the structured water one always kind of pops in. I think yeah, that and we're in and we're in muddy water, you know, to to like, you know, pun intended, I guess. We're in muddy water anyway in this whole realm. We all have to be careful in my mind not to get so far into the art of this that we are not making sure the science is there as well. So it's okay in my mind to kind of peek over the cliff and feel around and make speculations. But right now, this whole conversation, largely, that you and I have had is a speculative conversation. Now, of course, people like you and me are not afraid, never have been afraid to have those conversations and have never been afraid to use these technologies uh, prior to understanding them fully because we want to get results. But I will say we have to be very careful here and make sure that we don't go off running and making mistakes in terms of, and I do think a lot of people in our field are beginning to do that. They're going a little bit far with it where I don't, I just think all we need to say is, Hey, check it out, Janine, check it out, Jay, check it out. Like uh, everyone, you know, in this space, this is interesting. Let's see if there's anything to it. Let's not make definitive statements quite yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would absolutely agree with that. The same thing goes along the line of some of the biofield work with like, have you tried any of that stuff out? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, you know, I have a, I have a halo device that puts out uh, pulsed electromagnetic fields and have different different frequencies. And and because this is one of the things that's interesting, right? None of us have been trained. You know, as much as we're all now being coming very aware of frequencies and electromagnetic fields. This is not my training. In fact, it's so not my training that as I delve into this, I get completely confused and have yet to, after studying this stuff for three to five years, still can't necessarily explain fully to myself and my patients how these things are working because it's not my field. And we're relying a lot on engineers uh, who are, this is their field, who also don't have a medical background. And so there is a lot that is getting lost in translation with these things because the engineers are the ones who understand these things, not the practitioners so much. And so we are really in, you know, again, 
muddy waters. That being said, I can tell you I have a friend who raises horses and had a horse come up lame, which we all know can be uh, pretty dangerous. Like, you know, the, essentially the equivalent of a, a human twisting their ankle can be a real problem for a horse. And she has fallen in love with my halo device. As a matter of fact, she still has it. She will not give it back to me, basically, because she's like, this thing is amazing. She also got kicked by one of her horses and, uh, you know, really like kicked in the hand. You can imagine and probably fractured her wrist and used this halo device and was just like, this is this thing's amazing. And so, you know, it's an N of one. And certainly I haven't noticed much, but I've had no big injuries. But you know, we know that these things have been used. We know as far back as the 50s, right? They were using right. magnets and fields to regrow, uh, you know, frog legs, you know, and we know that, you know, certain uh, certain animals have this ability themselves, like salamanders can regenerate limbs and things like that. So we know there is a lot here and a lot of science here. Uh, we just, I certainly don't have, and I don't think the medicine yet has a full understanding of you know, which frequencies, you know, at what doses and which, you know, you know, all of that kind of stuff, I think still needs to be worked out. So again, we kind of are in interesting, uh, an interesting place. How about you? Do you feel like you have, you know, a really good understanding of this stuff yet? No. Not yet. Right. Yeah. Me no. neither. Yeah. I've tried it. You know, I'm like, oh, I feel nice and relaxed. It feels cool. I kind of felt like the, the amp coil, I felt like I was rocking during the treatment. I'm like, okay, it's relaxing, mm -hmm. you know, but in the difference between using that and like a harmony kind of table or one of the other things, I'm like, I, I can't really tell you the difference or like being in, in my own house with the music cranked up and, and, you know, having the, the amplifier with the, the Hertz mm -hmm. coming at me, I'm like, it kind of feels the same. Maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, I haven't really noticed it. I mean, ultimately what I would say is that once again, these kind of things have people back to the paradigm of looking for something outside of them for help. Yeah, very well said. I, I I was literally going to say that I think we have to, and this goes, this is across the board, isn't it? You know, I think of course we need drugs and surgeries and things like, of course we don't want, and of course supplements can do well, but I also think that's exactly right. I think that the naturopathic principles hold true, remove the obstacles to healing, remove the obstacles to fulfillment. Your body is telling you in the same way when you get injured or cut yourself or sprain your ankle, like we talked about, it's the same thing in the mental emotional space. And I think all of these modalities are incredibly powerful perhaps, but only if we can clear off the mud and, and we get in these th this movement happening. And, and here's the, the maybe the final thing I say, and we can kind of wrap this up. But one of the things I'll say as a final thing is that, and this is going to be depressing. So I hope everyone doesn't just like throw, you know, th throw their mobile device across the room when they hear this. One of the things, Janine, that I oftentimes marvel at is this idea we're in this really weird place where people are acting like they're going to live forever. Like, you know, life has a 100% fatality rate. There is no indication in my mind looking at any of the science, despite all the longevity books and all the people talking about that, that we are going to be able to stop aging and keep ourselves from getting sick and dying. Like that's that's the human condition. We don't have anyone who's ever not aged, not got old, not died, not gotten sick and died. And so I know that's depressing, but this is another final thing that I want to say. Some of this to me and why I've gotten into this new work is because to me, what I see is oftentimes a lot of people fearful of the human experience. And to me, I want my patients, whether I can get them healthy or not, because you and I have both been in this field a lot, a long time. We've watched people die. We've seen illness not get better despite all the things. I've seen vegans and vegetarians die of cancer. I've seen carnivore you know, people die of cancer. I've seen keto people die of cancer. I've seen them all you know, I've seen happy, healthy people, you know, go from heart attacks. I mean, you know, when you really get down to it, I'm like, I don't know why that happened. There's no rhyme or reason. I just know that we all have to go at some point. So part of me goes, a lot of the work then comes in making sure you matter and make a difference and live a fulfilled life and not carry all this mental, emotional trauma and drama and trial and tribulations you know, through this part of me thinks we're here for three reasons and three reasons only we're here to learn, we're here to teach and we're here to love. None of those, we can do all of those things while being unhealthy, while being exposed to EMFs, while, you know, eating junk food, while, you know, like we can do all those things. So in a sense, I go, 
Maybe that's more what it's about. And maybe all this other stuff, it's important, but maybe staying healthy is just so we can stay vibrant and healthy and vital long enough to do the spiritual learning and teaching and loving that we're here to do. And so that's kind of where I come at it from now. And I know that might not be uh, a, a comforting thing for people to hear, but I do think it's important because uh, at some point I am going to lie down. It's just going to be me. No one's going to be holding my hand. Maybe they will, but I got to, I got to pass over, you know, by myself. And I want to be proud of what I've accomplished and have learned the lessons and lived a good story. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will say it. I do think that's what this world's about and mm -hmm. in our experience here. And I think that in the realm of the anti-aging biohacking, you know, <laughs> universe, yes, I've dove in full, full on a lot of things, but at the same time, I've never really came to the conclusion that any of this is going to have me living, you know, to 200 years of mm -hmm. age. At some point I will die. And it, heck, I'd like to enjoy my life instead of being completely obsessed by all the things I need to do to prolong it and miss out on my life while I'm trying to do that. 100%. Couldn't agree more. Crazy. It's crazy. So let's let's tell folks about Next Level Human, all mm. of the offerings you have, how they can work with you, because you have your four purposes that I didn't mm. even get to ask you to, <laughs> to share with people because we just dove in. But, yeah. but, but you know, I know there are four things and, and four reasons you, you have us here or that, that yeah. you believe we're here for. And so I'll let yeah. you kind of share all of your. Yeah. Stories. You know, next level human really came out of this work, right? This idea of like, you know, uh, being able to, you know, do your life in a way that helps you matter and make a difference. I do believe that most people want that. And we have four jobs every human has, right? So that is health and fitness. Yes, we have to stay healthy, attain and maintain our health and fitness. We have finances, which a lot of people don't love the idea of that, but we have to earn and manage a living. Even if you're homeless out on the street, you have to procure food and find shelter. We have personal relationships. We must manage other people, give and receive love, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then to me, the most important thing is purpose and meaning, fulfillment and doing our work here, making a distinction between our job is how we make money and our work is how we make a difference. And so Next Level Human is really about helping people live their optimal life through the mastery of these four jobs. And a big part of that actually comes from doing the work, that three-part process of going in and using events and coaching and this breath work and meditation and journaling as primary tools, although there's others, to begin to help us make sense of what our suffering has been and turn that suffering into a source of meaning, to take our mental, emotional pain and make it a path to purpose, to take our hurt and make it as a way to help. And this, to me, is what Next Level Human's all about. And so if you're somebody who's dealing with illness and repeated patterns in weight loss and all of that kind of stuff or repeated patterns in finance or repeated patterns in, uh, you know, uh, relationships and things like that and just want to elevate your life to get healthier, to live, you know, more purposeful. Next Level Human really bridges all of those things. We run events. We do high end coaching. Uh, and to me, it's, uh, you know, the most amazing thing that I've done. I've seen more changes in individuals doing this work in terms of their health, their fitness, their ability to even, even people who have mastering finances that always struggled. And that's the work. And you can find out more there on my podcast, Next Level Human. Uh, you can find me on social media at JTita and at Next Level Human. And yeah, feel free to reach out, DM me. It's a it's an interesting world of social media now where we can get in touch with each other. So any of you listening to this that want to ask me questions, I do my best to answer those. Sometimes it takes a little bit to get to them. But uh, yeah, so anyone who's interested in checking all that out, I would love to have you as, as a, uh, a part of that. Love it, Jade. Such good stuff. And I know personally, a couple of folks have been through your programs as well, who have wonderful things to say and, and you're doing good work and gosh, keep it up, man. It's, it's good stuff. It's inspiring for all of us folks looking outside going, hmm. yeah, mm. he's onto <laughs> it. He's onto it there. Well, <laughs> I so appreciate you. Appreciate you, Janine. Thank you for your, your work. And, um, you know, one thing I'll say that I just uh, I love, you know, we, when we, you and I went through naturopathic medical school, right, one of the first things that we learned is doctor as teacher. And so uh, 
you and I both share that. And so thank you for teaching and giving me a, a place to teach as well. My pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.